Paul, welcome to the Drucker Business Forum. Thank you. I, I don't think we can even start after that introduction, right? So I think we'll just go home. <laughs> sure, let's just jump right to the book signing, right? <laughs> so um, I, I want to start this morning with uh, a couple of big picture questions to help people uh, get a sense of um, what the sort of the grand uh, arc of your work is. And um, one of the big assumptions that your, you and your work have really helped to debunk is that uh, humans are always rational, that we're always making our decisions on a rational basis. And um, so I'd like to start by just having you uh, take us for a minute through, if we aren't always rational animals, what are we then? How are we making the choices that we make? Uh, I don't know. You've had your car fixed recently, right? You go to the car dealer and the guy says, um, you need a new uh, Johnson rod. And you go, I don't know what that is. They say, well, it's 200 bucks. Your car will be ready to go. And what do you say? Well, I've been going here. It's the Chevy dealer. It's whatever. My quarter shop, and I don't know what Johnson Rod is, but it's 200 bucks and my car can go, right? So why would you ever do that? So the standard model economics says that you should spend an enormous amount of time and energy to investigate this mechanic, what a Johnson Rod is, does your car really need it? Or you could just pay the 200 bucks and be on your way in two hours, which is what most of us do, right? And it's a different story if you're in the middle of Kansas driving across country and the mechanic says, you need a Johnson rod and it's $4,000, right? Then you're going to investigate, right? So the brain is exquisitely good at making these cost-benefit analyses. And one of those is time. Right? Is it worth my time to go investigate this? And person, right? So we are gregariously social creatures. And so we're really good at picking up, oh, that guy looks trustworthy. And that guy, kind of sketchy, I'm not sure. <laughs> so how do we do that, right? That's the only way we can navigate through the sea of strangers. So there's no neurologic definition of rationality, right? Your brain is an integrated organ. We're using every piece of information to make as good a decisions as possible. And one of those decisions is, is this person in front of me or are these people around me, do they appear safe? Do they appear trustworthy? Do they appear like someone that I want to spend time around? If they are, then we're biased, we've shown in our experiments, to reach out to that person and give them the opportunity to uh, you know, uh, follow up on whether we're going to trust them or not. So I'm going to give you, I'm not going to, again, I'm not going to write the check for $4,000, but I might write the check for two hundred dollars and see what happens. And so as we do that, we're learning about this kind of social system we're in, but how we do that I think is really interesting in the brain. Hmm. Decision making starts in some very important ways with trust. How do we get from trust then to happiness? So let's go to trust first. And so we had shown, as you said, in 2004 and through 10 years worth of laboratory experiments that the brain produces this chemical oxytocin, which I call the moral molecule, that motivates us to behave in positive social ways. So the, the back story here is that this is not morality with a capital M, it's morality with a small m. So morality essentially means the golden rule. So I'm going to treat you equal to my own needs, right? So I'm going to put your needs equal to mine. If I put your needs above a mine, I call that virtuous behavior, and we've investigated that as well. But let's just talk with this, this small m moral behavior. Why would you ever engage in moral behavior? Because that's what sustains you in the social group, right? So if I am that mechanic, and I take your $200, uh, I put in a rusty couple of bolts in your car, send you on the way, your car breaks down, what happens to me? People start talking, right? Say, oh, that mechanic's a cheat. Never go there. I'm going to call the attorney general's office. I'm going to do on and on and on. And this guy's out of business eventually, right? He's like, this is a good short-run strategy, perhaps, but long run, it's not going to work so well. Plus, you can have a lot of really unhappy people. They scream and yell. They throw bricks through your window. Not so nice, right? So, so the first part is we're social creatures. So understanding we're social creatures uh, tells us that these sort of standard, um, narrowly self-interested models economists really like um, often don't work so well. So we have this underlying social nature and we've shown in these 10 years' worth of experiments is that that social nature or those social behaviors are driven primarily by the release of this chemical oxytocin, which motivates us to connect to others. So oxytocin is this little ancient molecule. I'm getting to the question, I know. Is this little ancient molecule that 10 years ago was only known in humans to facilitate birth and breastfeeding, but we've shown in all these experiments is that there's lots of ways that we release oxytocin. Just someone showing they trust us, our brains release this, and we want to reciprocate. Why? That sustains us in the social group. Okay, so how do we get to moral behavior, some moral behaviors to happiness? So we've shown in experiments that those who release the most oxytocin are in fact happier in their lives, and they're happier because they have better relationships of all types. They have better romantic relationships, they have more close friends, they're closer to family. 
They're even kinder to strangers in our laboratory tasks. By the way, they have more sex with fewer partners, too. So at every level, they're connecting better to the people around them because they're building these high-quality relationships. And those could be business relationships. Again, they could be romantic. They could be friendships. So I think there's a lot of ways that we're finding that our brains release oxytocin for all kinds of settings, even with strangers, that connect us to others, motivate us to behave in ways that sustain us in these social groups, and in fact, make us happy. It would be really helpful for folks now to hear um, just a little bit more about how exactly you've discovered these things. Um, one of the tools you've used um, to great effect is actually a, a very common experimental tool in experimental economics labs. It's this thing called the trust game, uh, except you've produced some novel approaches to the trust game in your lab that have really revealed insights that were not available for many decades before. So could you tell us just a little bit about what the trust game is and how you've used it to draw these insights out about the work of oxytocin? In my uh, economist world in the late 90s, I had done work showing that measures of interpersonal trust strongly predicted which countries would be rich and which would be poor. So high trust countries are by and large wealthy countries. Poor countries have very low levels of trust. When trust is low, there are fewer economic transactions that create wealth and help alleviate poverty. So trust is this big deal, and so this work had a big impact. The World Bank flies me out. You know, how do we raise trust in these developing countries? And inevitably, I would get this question, well, why would two strangers ever trust each other? And at first, I kind of punted on that question. I thought, well, you know, I can tell you about the environments. I can tell you why Norway is really trusting and Colombia is not. I thought, you know, what a weenie I am if I can't answer that simple question. Like, that's the key question, isn't it? So, as you said, we, we had two problems to go forward with this research. One was, how do you measure trust in a controlled laboratory setting? And I'm a skeptic, you guys. I don't want to just ask people, hey, are you a nice person? Do you give money to the homeless? Or, you know, could people say, yes, of course I am. So instead, we had to say to tempt people with virtue and vice using money. Okay, so we would use this trust task, which I'll tell you about in a second. But in addition, because people don't clearly articulate why they're doing what they're doing to measure brain activity while people made decisions involving trust. Okay, so here's the task. We recruit a bunch of people like you for this experiment. If you agree to sit in these hard chairs for an hour and a half, you get 10 bucks. And then you log into a computer with a secret number, so your data are completely anonymous. You're in a partitioned computer booth, and you got 10 or 12 or 15 people in the lab with you. And the computer matches you up in a pair with somebody else who's also got $10 for sitting in these hard chairs for an hour. Okay. And then after lots of instruction, and never ever do we deceive people, because we're the good behavior guys, bad karma if we deceive people, um, uh, you get this prompt high computer saying, okay, you're matching a pair with somebody else in the lab, you can't see this person or talk to them, and here's your decision. You're the first decision maker in your pair, and you can give up some of the $10 that you've earned for being here and ship it to the person you've been matched to. Now, whatever you give up comes out of your account, but gets tripled in the other person's account. Right? Then the second person gets a prompt by computer saying, let's say guy one gives up eight of its 10 bucks. So guy one keeps two, and now guy two just got 24, three times eight, plus their $10 for showing up. They have $34 in their account. So the computer says, hey, guy one sent you 24 bucks. You have 34 in your account. Would you like to send some amount back to the first person? Okay, so if you think about that task, you know, there's sort of two ways to think about it. One is the sort of standard economic way, if you're, quote, rational and self-interested. If you're a guy, too, money is good. Oh, I'm sorry, I forgot to tell you guys. I'm going to jab your arm with a needle twice and take four tubes of blood each time. So you're literally making decisions based on blood money. So people take this really seriously. <laughs> right? So if you're a guy, too, isn't money good? No one's watching. You get paid by a cashier in a different building and doesn't even know you're an experiment. Why would you not keep all the money? Therefore, if you're guy one, you should send no money. But the other way to think about it is, hey, the pie's growing by a factor of three. I should send all my money to this guy on the assumption that he gets it. Right, dude, I hope you get it. Share some of the largesse back with me. So what we find is that almost everybody does this. So the consensus view in experimental economics is that the more money you send as the first decision maker, uh, that you're, the more you're signaling trust. And the return transfer from guy two, which is not tripled, comes out of guy two's account one for one is a measure of reciprocity or trustworthiness. And economists were flummoxed on why person two would ever return money, because money is really good. Why don't we all like money? And Except if we could actually, let's put, it, let's put some dollar figures yeah. on this for a second. I'm curious, you all can, you can do a quick mental calculation. Imagine you're person one, you've got your $10, you've now been asked how much of that you want to transfer to someone else who you don't know and will never be identified to you and have it tripled. So imagine in your mind how much you might want to do. 
Now, what do you guys tend to see in the lab, Paul? What's we see about 90% of first decision makers send money, and 95% of the second decision makers who receive money return it. And what's the typical range of dollars that you see changing hands? So the most common transfer is $5. Okay. So people kind of split in the difference. Okay. And what we find is that if, uh, uh, if you don't show any trust or any trustworthiness, everyone leaves with 10 bucks. On average, uh, first decision makers make about 14, and second decision, ma decision makers make about 17. Okay. So why so much trust and trustworthiness? What we showed with the blood draws is that the more you receive as decision maker two denoting trust, the more your brain produces oxytocin, the more oxytocin in your system, the more money you return. Okay. So you have an underlying biology of reciprocation. Again, that's what it means to be a social creature. What we didn't know before these experiments is that this held in this sort of economic world. Right? Again, the mechanic might cheat you a little bit, you know, you never know. Or he's got to build in some, you know, buffer because you never know when he, you know, he might take more time than he estimated. But if he cheats you too much, right, he's out of business. So how do we modulate that? So again, now we've got 10 years worth of experiments showing that in all kinds of settings, uh, oxytocin makes us uh, generous, makes us charitable. Uh, in fact, it makes us feel empathy, makes us uh, connected emotionally to others. And that's the way that we sustain ourselves in the social group you're actually able to manipulate behavior in the lab by dosing people with oxytocin. So it's not just saying, oh, your brain's doing something somewhere uh, in some MRI scanner, right? This is, you know, we can do this in the field. Um, yeah, so we developed this nasal inhaler in which we can safely shoot synthetic oxytocin into the human brain. And again, in hundreds and hundreds of, of people have we put through this, no one's ever gotten sick. We don't use a big drill, we just shoot it up your nose. And in fact, we can turn on these moral behaviors like a garden hose. Of course, the folks who've been dosed with oxytocin become even more generous, right? They do, more generous, more charitable, more trusting. Um, and yet the, the brain's own oxytocin system is much more graded. So if I can give a, a short yeah. example. So um, uh, one of the kind of crazy experiments we talk about in the book, I think it illustrates this really well, is a wedding that I attended in uh, southern England a couple summers ago. So I went to this wedding. It's in this big, beautiful rented mansion. And there's 100 people, they're all dressed beautifully, and I drive up in my rented Vauxhall, and I take out of my trunk a centrifuge and dry ice and needles and test tubes and tourniquets. And I took blood from the bride and the groom and the wedding party and the family and the friends before and after the vows to ask, you know, why would we spend $100,000 on a wedding? You know, why do people cry at weddings? What's the deal? So what we found was that, in fact, weddings not only release oxytocin, they do so in a, in a very particular pattern. So who's the center of the wedding solar system? The bride, right? She had the biggest increase in oxytocin. Okay, who loves the wedding almost as much as the bride? Her mother, absolutely, she was number two. <laughs> then the groom's father, then the groom, then the family and the friends. So they're arrayed around the bride like planets around the sun. So it tells us that this molecule is not you know, zero to 100. It's not like, oh, I see my friend Zach and I release oxytocin and all of a sudden I'm you know, giving away my wallet to him. It's that I'm, I have this great effect, right? So. We've known each other a lot, a lot, long time, and I'm happy to give him my wallet because I know I'm get it back. Even if I didn't get it back, actually, I'm happy to give it to him. It's fine, <laughs> um, you know. Uh, but I don't know. Um, uh, my friend in the front row, uh, I might give you ten bucks if you ask me, but I'm not sure I'm going to give you a hundred, right? So, uh, right. So, how do we, how do we have that graded response? So the wedding showed that, right? It shows this system is telling us about the strength of relationships and the strength of emotional connection, and that's also important to sustain ourselves in a social group. Again, you and I. I hope we're friends for our entire lives, right? And that's probably a good shot. But, you know, um, I don't know. We could be friends, right? But we got to spend some more time together. So right now, we'll touch you a little bit, right? So we're building these relationships. And I think this underpins the underlying basis for things like prosperity, for the desire for human liberty, right? We want to be recognized as individuals, but we're also embedded in these social groups. Oxytocin is an extremely important part of the story, but it's not the only part of the story. And in fact, at this wedding, I think interestingly, as you discovered, the number two increase in oxytocin actually did not belong to the groom. That's right. Which it's you might expect intuitively when you ask who's at the center of the wedding solar system, of course the bride, you'd expect the next ring out would be the groom. Right. And, and in some respects, maybe it is, but not in terms of oxytocin. And that's because, as you've noted, there's this interesting relationship between oxytocin and testosterone. And you want to talk a little bit about what's going on with the groom and then right. uh, what's sort of going on more generally with the way these two uh, neurotransmitters, these two chemicals, uh, sort of do a dance in our brains. So, you know, research is fascinating, you guys. You know, it's just so great to be able to use all these tools of neuroscience to explore stuff that we find interesting. So 
uh, previous research has shown that when men are in committed relationships, their testosterone falls. Now, why is this interesting? Because testosterone inhibits the release of oxytocin. So uh, w when you have children, your testosterone falls. And so you know, the, your, the, the body is preparing yourself to be um, less dominant and more nurturing, if you will. So we found in the wedding and that we thought, so this, when this groom says his vows, his you know, testosterone would go to zero because now he's, you know, he's taken or something. So we found just the opposite. His testosterone doubled. Well, why? The bride's the center of attention, but she's wearing this beautiful strapless gown. She looks wonderful. He's thinking about the honeymoon, right? So, okay. So uh, as X said, you know, we're constantly balancing this kind of connection molecule oxytocin with the sort of other half of the rocket thruster that lets us navigate through the sea of strangers, which is testosterone. So testosterone inhibits the release of oxytocin, focuses individuals on uh, the short term, on things like risk taking, and we need both that, right? If I never take any risk, I stay home and sit in my couch all day and nothing happens to me. So, um, so testosterone is an important part of that story. So men on average have about 10 times the testosterone as women. So in experiments where we administer testosterone to men, compared to themselves on placebo, uh, these alpha males are more selfish and more entitled. Big surprise, right? Okay, so who are the most selfish and entitled people on the planet? Teenage boys, which half of us used to be, right? Okay, so, but what do high testosterone individuals do? Uh, often male, but sometimes female. They will also punish people who violate implicit cooperation norms. These experiments, if we give you a chance to, say if you don't like the share of money someone offers you, then you can use your money to hurt them, like make them lose money, not physically hurt them. Although the testosterone response is also about physical pain as well. Um, men will do that much more than women. So we find a couple things from a, from a so gender differences perspective. For every experiment we've run in 10 years, women release more oxytocin than men. So that tells us that they're, in fact, more trustworthy, more compassionate, uh, kinder. So we know this, right? Women are nicer than men. Now you know why. They release more oxytocin. But what do men do? They're the enforcers. So there's two ways to sustain appropriate social behaviors or moral behaviors. One is oxytocin. So if I release oxytocin, I feel empathy. I'm less likely to hurt someone that I feel emotionally connected to. But the second side is, oh, if you play bad, and your experience is when you play bad with me, I'm going to play bad with you, testosterone, that also may keep you on the straight and narrow. So with these two biological factors, or sort of yin and yang of biology right inside of us, so I like to say, you know, we don't need God or government telling us what to do because we have this internal sort of gyroscope telling us what to do. So I'm going to amend that just a little bit. We might need a little God and a little government because our brains are awash in the sea of chemicals, as you've said, and there's a couple others we discussed in the book that are also important. And sometimes our moral intuitions fail, right? Sometimes I get to a point where I'm too aggressive I'm, uh, or I'm not making good decisions. Or maybe sometimes I, I meet a con man and I'm giving away my wallet when I really shouldn't. So I think, you know, within the sort of range that we normally sit in, oxytocin and testosterone are pretty good rocket thrusters. But as we get further out, it's nice to have society say or same, some great book say, look, here's a bright line, right? Here, you're, you know, you're on your own, you're okay. But once you get to here, whatever that is, murder, usually not a good idea, right? We're going to say that's bad, Unlike, with exceptions, right? Soldiers fighting other soldiers, we say that's acceptable, right? But, um, you know, killing your spouse, mm, no, not probably a good idea. You found in your research that extremes of all kinds, as you noted, you know, people who are extremely senior within an organization, so the most senior executives, also in some cases extremely re uh, religiously devout community members, um, seem, uh, those extremes seem to put people out of balance particularly with respect to their oxytocin gyroscope, as you call it. So um, I wonder if you could talk in particular about senior executives in organizations and um, what tend, and this is of course not everybody, but this is on average, right? What tends to happen where, the, where there's an inclination to happen to folks when you reach that very senior level, how does that gyroscope get out of balance? Anyone ever had a bad boss? <laughs> Anyone think for like two seconds about killing your boss? <laughs> oh, just me. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> too much testosterone. Um, <laughs> Uh, yeah, where's the bad boss come from? Because, you know, a lot of them used to be kind of nice when they were not the boss. Um, so if you win a chess match, your testosterone goes up, right? A little bit. Um, if, uh, who's playing tonight? The Kings. If the Kings win, your testosterone goes up, right? So, um, you know, your brain is, is telling you about how important you are relative to your group. And when your testosterone's up, it says, baby, you got the best genes in the world. You rock. Everyone should want to mate with you. Everyone wants to be around you. 
And so it, again, it narrows the focus to you, to you being you know, the center of attention, you taking risks, you having the best genes. And so as we go up in the social hierarchy, at work, at home, whatever, um, your testosterone will go up if you become the boss. And by the way, so alpha males or alpha females, happens to women too, by the way. So as your, as your status goes up, your testosterone goes up, and then your body is saying, hey, you are the top dog. It's all about you. So I think one of the values of the book is to give people a language to understand their own behavior and the behavior of people around them. Because people around you can make your life fabulous and wonderful, or they can make it really awful, right? So I think having your own insight, look, I'm the boss, great. I know that my brain's going to uh, sort of focus the attention on me. What I want to do is kind of diffuse that. And so we, uh, we're running a meeting next week, actually, uh, called The Joy of Management. And a lot of this is about um, understanding how to get the best out of people who work with you to help make them successful. And it's not normally about, hey, I'm the CEO. It's all about me. My name's on everything. It's about really reaching out and using these, this gyroscope. So sometimes, you know, testosterone appro appropriate, right? So, um, you know, you threaten my kids, you got a world of hurt coming at you, right? But if you wanna, I don't know, bring, your, bring Riley over, your daughter to come play with mine, it's all about oxytocin. So again, I think having these insights that these uh, chemicals are so evolutionarily old that they're way out of conscious awareness, we can become more aware of them and therefore be better at modulating them. You, you described uh, your early days as a gonzo science, right? Sort of the manner of Hunter S. Thompson gonzo journalism. Um, because it turns out it's not actually a trivial thing if what you want to do is get into a lab and dose people with oxytocin or testosterone. Uh, you actually dosed yourself first uh, in order to determine how this was going to work in a laboratory setting. And um, I wonder if you could just share, share a bit with folks about what that was like and uh, if there are any future researchers in the room, if you have a recommendation about whether gonzo science is the right route to take <laughs> earlier in your career or if you'd advise against it. There's a short backstory, and I don't want to go on too much, but uh, you know, when we had done the blood work on trust, you know, we had no, I had no lab, I had no money, I had nothing. So I got this postdoc UCLA to give me access to this lab, behavioral lab, and I had a, a graduate student at Claremont who was a medical doctor who donated, donated a bunch of equipment, centrifuges and supplies, and um, uh, helped train me, did original blood draws on the blood work. And uh, so this is like kind of making an indie movie, right? So we're in Claremont, we would t toss all the stuff in my car, a bunch of graduate students, drive out to UCLA with a couple thousand dollars, you know, run these experiments, you know, process all this blood on site, you know, put it in a borrowed minus 80 centigrade freezer and you'll sa save these samples. But as we started getting better and better results, that, oh yeah, oxytocin seems to motivate us to reciprocate, it was really clear to me that the next experiment was to manipulate oxytocin directly and make sure that we hadn't missed some kind of weird pathway, that it was directly oxytocin to trust. But the FDA got involved because this is a prescription drug. So the Nobel Prize in Chemistry in 1953 was given for the synthesis of oxytocin. Around 10,000 women a day get this, called Pitocin to speed up birth. Right, that's what oxytocin was known for. So this drug's available, it's very safe, right? it's got a 50 year history, and there's an intranasal version, there's a version that women spray up their noses to help them initiate breastfeeding, that went off the market in the US in the 1980s, and is still sold in Europe. So I, I don't know why women in Europe have more trouble initiating breastfeeding than women in the US, but anyway, still sold there, it's generic, it's very, very cheap, and so you fill out some paperwork from the FDA, you import it, boom, I'm doing my experiment. Except the FDA said, no, no, no. Turns out, after you know, two years of investigation by me and the drug companies, that there's a couple different ingredients uh, in the European version versus the US approved version. And the US version was just off the market by then. They said, no, you can't import this stuff. So in desperation, we did our first oxytocin inhaler study in Europe. But you know, it's, it's a pain in the ass to fly every week to Switzerland. Right? So anyway, so you know, I thought, how do I kind of do this in a you know, an ethical, legal way with FDA approval, but still do it in the United States. And so we began experimenting, or I've been, been experimenting on infusing oxytocin, say oxytocin into myself. So what's the risk of that? Oxytocin is this is signal of, of safety, and a signal safety in a lot of different ways in the brain, but one way is to reduce your heart rate, right? Think of you're stressed out, your heart rate goes up. Oh no, uh, what's gonna happen to me? So this reduces heart rate a little bit, 
And so if you take too much oxytocin, you could pass out. It's not gonna kill you. By the way, we've got, I think I've put, certainly put more people on oxytocin than anybody in the United States, around 800 people, and no one's ever had a headache, a tummy ache, no one's ever passed out. I mean, it's very, very safe. But what's the right dose? Right now I'm using this approved, FDA-approved drug in a non-approved delivery method. So who will I test, my, test it on? It's gotta be me. So my wife's a physician. Her office, luckily, is about four doors down from the emergency room. So I would go in her office, and I would try every way short of a drill to get the stuff in my brain, eyedroppers, aerosolizers, and then I would sit in her office and let her watch me. And I said, look, if I pass out, just wheel me down to the emergency room, they'll give me a drug and raise my blood pressure. So I never passed out. And now we have AFD approval, so I make this stuff at home in my bathtub, and we can run lots of studies. <laughs> Yeah. As you mentioned in the book, there are a whole class of not FDA-approved oxytocin products that are now available out on the market. I think right. you at, at one point counted 76 pages of results on Google of products you can purchase that uh, promise in some way or another to administer oxytocin to you or to others around you and to produce some of these effects. Oftentimes, these companies are actually citing your research specifically That's to right. back up their claims. Um, should we all be running out and buying these things and trying to use them or not? What's, the, uh, what's your view on this? So this is a prescription drug, and so you cannot get it through the internet. Uh, I mean, they're homeopathic, right? So there's nothing in there. Um, so we have developed in the laboratory tons of different ways to induce the brain to release its own oxytocin. And this is interesting because uh, in animals, and so there's some evidence of this in humans now, that the more you release oxytocin, the more you connect to others, the easier it is to release oxytocin. And when you release oxytocin, again, you reduce stress. We've actually shown you improve the immune system, and you're going to be happier. You're going to connect better to people. So how do we know? Lots of animal research. And who's subject number one? Me, right? So I'm actually an introvert, and it's not that I'm shy. I just I get tired kind of being around people. And I've actually, in the last number of years, kind of forced myself to connect better to people. So lots of ways your brain can release its own oxytocin. Don't buy this stuff on the Internet. And since... Uh, I knew I was coming today. I have an example of how to do one of those in my little bag. This is for you, my dear friend. What does that say? All right. <laughs> That's the prescription. Eight hugs a day. Right. So that means you're getting dosing every hour. Now, this is a very important <laughs> T-shirt. Uh, this heart on there is made of something called thermochromic ink, and when you hug, it will change color. So. Yeah, put your hand on there. Yeah, put your hand on there, it'll get lighter. Uh, so there's lots of ways to do it, but basically it's spending time with people. So things like uh, singing, dancing together, praying or meditating, uh, exercising together, even using social media will release oxytocin. So we're a connecting species, and I think we should just embrace that. We need to be around other humans. We say we don't. I don't care what the other people say about me, but of course we do, right? So I think if we embrace that and say, you know what, with so much value from having relationships, but I think that's the triumph of the human species, is that because of this oxytocin system that gives us at least some kind of quick and dirty uh, sense of whether people around us are safe or not safe, we've been able to do things like build civilizations where we live and work around people that we're not genetically related to. And so our triumph is that we've been able to extract value from social relationships, even with complete strangers. We're not forced just to live in these tiny little kin-based groups. We can actually interact with all kinds of people and that value can be economic value, it can be social value, friendships, can be romantic relationships. So we can do this with almost anybody, right? And so I think once we realize that, we're really connected to the entire human family, and there's great value to having those connections. So if we're interested in boosting oxytocin in our relationships and our communities, um, you describe the commercial products for purchase as um, effectively expensive and not very useful perfume. Right. So if you really like how the oxytocin spray smells, go ahead and buy it for the smell, but it's certainly not going to actually induce oxytocin-type effects in other people or in yourself. Um, but you've also noted, and, and you mentioned um, earlier, uh, the comparison in trust levels between, let's say, Norway and Colombia. Tends to be a great discrepancy. Um, but uh, you did some, some investigation into specifically the city of Bogota in, in Colombia, which has actually undergone quite a transformation through uh, really... Uh, not aerosolizing oxytocin across the city, right? But in fact, through actually oxytocin boosting management techniques at the city level. Um, what they did in, in Bogota, which 10, 12 years ago, was among the most dangerous cities in the world. I mean, shootings, uh, kidnapping was one of the biggest businesses there. 
um, again, because of all the drug money floating around and the FARC, which are a paramilitary uh, group. Anyway, uh, now it's actually a very, very safe city. Uh, tourism is one of the biggest businesses in Bogota, surprisingly. Why? They had this crazy mayor named Antanas Mokas, who was a philosophy professor, he got elected mayor, and this is like, uh, you know, taking control of a company that's going down the tubes, right? This, this city's going down the tubes. So do you shut it down or do you, you know, do crazy stuff? He tried crazy stuff. He would shower on TV to show how to save water. He asked people to pay their taxes, which they started doing, shocking in Colombia. And he did things like hiring mimes to stand at street corners and to shame people who would violate uh, uh, traffic laws. People just wouldn't stop at stop signs or say, you know. So this sort of social <laughs> behavior that, you know, we're all part of the same social group. And once we recognize this, and we use both the oxytocin style, look, I'm showering on TV because, not because I'm a nut, because I want to show you that hey, we have a water shortage. Let's, let's say, you know, turn off the water while you're soap or whatever. And I'm going to use the sort of testosterone. I'm going to shame you if you're not doing the right thing. The city really turned around. They closed a lot of streets in the, in the, for, for cars in the weekends, had these bike parades. They had something called Women's Night. So it was a very unsafe city. And so they had a night where all the police uh, officers were women. The men all stayed home, watched the kids, and the women get, had the run of the city. Hugely successful. It's been actually uh, copied by a number of cities around the world, including in the U.S. And so really empowering individuals to take control of their lives, take control of their city, and that has changed radically. Subtitle of your book has the word uh, prosperity, and this is the moral molecule, the source of love and prosperity. Can you talk a little bit more now about, um, I, I think, as we zoom out from these local city examples, we get to the national and international stage, what role oxytocin plays in creating prosperous societies, strong economies? The, you know, love is always a complicated word for us. So, um, you know, when I speak to corporate groups, I encourage them to use the L word. So this is not romantic love. This is philia, right? This is care for other people around us. And oxytocin does motivate us to care for others. And we should recognize that in any organization we're in, for-profit, non-profit, government, if we don't care about the people around us, it's just going to be a terrible place to work. Performance is going to be lower. And so I think, you know, embracing the L word is, is okay. There's science behind it. It's not squishy. You can tell the people around you that you work with, that you love them. It's okay. I love you. You know that. Okay. Uh, so the second part is prosperity. So coming back to the very beginning, which is, you know, why do countries, some countries become wealthy and other countries stay mired in poverty? And trust is this kind of big lever that really produces that. And when you have high trust, you can actually start this virtuous cycle in which, um, trust is high, therefore I'm more relaxed and comfortable. I'm more able to release oxytocin. That motivates a variety of moral behaviors, being trustworthy, being compassionate, being empathic, being generous, which can also facilitate things like wealth creation. Right now I'm connecting better to people. I'm building more social relationships, which alleviates more poverty, which moves people away from survival stress, which gives them the luxury of releasing oxytocin, connecting to others. And now we have this positive feedback loop in which in some sense, the rich get richer and happier and more tolerant. So we have nice data in the end of the book on uh, things like toleration for people who are different than us, uh, trustworthiness, happiness. These all have a nice income gradient. So, um, you know, it's good to have money. Money's good. Again, if you're in the very top echelon, 1%, you know, suppress your desire to be a, um, you know, alpha dog and, you know, whatever, behave badly. But for everybody else, yeah, more income is better. And if we understand that, then hopefully we can engineer, or there are ways to use the science to engineer um, for developing countries, you know, how to raise prosperity by understanding that we can harness the power of social relationships, but it requires release of oxytocin, trust, and actually good institutions. And so um, we have a whole chapter in the book on the sort of horse race we've run between what comes first, release of oxytocin or good government, good social sector, good economic sector. And it's the latter. You need, you need good institutions of all types before people have, again, sort of this luxury of releasing oxytocin, connecting to others. So set the system up, and then it's really this bottom-up uh, uh, ability. Once we have stability, people are going to find those social connections. They're going to find ways to build friendships, build relationships, build economic uh, transactions with others. And once they do that, then you have this again, positive feedback loop. Now, you can unwind this, and we've seen lots of, you know, uh, think of Syria, right? This, this country's unwinding rapidly. Um, but if you can get on the right track, it can be self-sustaining. Sure. Yeah. 
for executives and managers who are interested in specific techniques you can use within a single organization to boost oxytocin and create a more trusting and prosperous work environment. Are there specific things that people can do? So, there's, again, there's lots of these in the book, and I just want to go through uh, sort of one. So, uh, with the rise of the knowledge worker, this is a great Peter Drucker term from the 1950s, um, you know, as individuals are more dependent within organizations on their own outcomes, um, it's really important to recognize that. And so for managers, one way you can do that is through um, very clear transparency. So again, if I want to trust a guy in the front row, if he's you know, shifty eye, if he's looking around, if I can't get a sense that he's comfortable, that I know where he's coming from, I'm not going to release oxytocin, right? I'm going to be much more on edge. So I think from a management perspective, one thing you can do is have uh, lots of transparency. So if you want me to follow, sorry, if, you want, if I want you to follow me, I've got to actually show you where we're going, what the goals are. But if you think I have a bunch of hidden agendas, I'm doing this and that, I'm going to dismantle your unit in two years and whatever, or two months, you know, I'm going to be less, much less likely to kind of be on board. So uh, human beings, we're herd creatures. We want to be led, but we don't want to be led down a path which is dangerous or which is, has so much uncertainty that we're uncomfortable being there. So um, you know, the stress of meeting a goal is very important. In fact, moderate stress increases the release of oxytocin. It brings people together to, for a common purpose. But high stress shuts that down, and uncertainty is just a killer for trust. And so we need to sort of modulate this. So, so again, there's a whole list in the book, but transparency is one. So a lot of companies, uh, Whole Foods, uh, which is just around the corner, Trader Joe's, they release their quarterly profit loss statements to all their employees. And in fact, Whole Foods pays employees to take sort of a basic accounting course. They can read that profit and loss statement. So everyone knows what everyone's doing, right? So um, I'm working here in Pasadena at Whole Foods, and I get quarterly our profit and loss statement. So I know what's happening in my store. I'm, I'm part of that solution as opposed to, you know, I'm a, a cog in this giant wheel. I want to be part of the bigger solution. I want to think about, hey, how can I help my store create better customer service? Uh, so I think that transparency is very important. And by the way, Doug Rauch, who's the former CEO of Trader Joe's, who I saw last week in Boston, um, mentioned that uh, their quarterly reports once were leaked to their competitor, Whole Foods. And um, you know, that's the risk. So when you're transparent, it also means people can take advantage of you. Um, he said, you know what? So Trader Joe's is private. It's a private company, so they don't release public information. He said, you know, they, they saw our numbers. What can we do? You know, um, so. Fine. So again, I think it's like individual relationships. You have to be willing to take some risk. Right, so oxytocin is like love, right? It is really the molecule of love. So you can't force someone to love you. You can love them and, and usually get that in return. Not, not usually. Sometimes you get it in return. So the same way, I think, with, within organizations and the lab I run and the department I run, you know, you, I have to make other people successful. I have to show them the path. I have to help them get there. And I want to make sure that, you know, they see everything I'm doing, you know, because they're much more likely to be on board that way. So anyway, lots of others, but yeah. now we're That's losing great. time. Um, one more question from, uh, from up front here, and then we're going to uh, turn it over to you all to, to get engaged in the conversation. Um, Paul, you quote the popular Freakonomics writers. These guys have written a book and have a blog in the New York Times website, Freakonomics blog. Uh, Stephen Levitt and Stephen Dubner's claim that, uh, as they put, quote, morality is the way we would like the world to work. Economics is how it actually does work. And uh, not so fast, you say in, in, in your book. And uh, what's wrong with, with that view? Right. So as we've said over the past hour, you know, if you're not a moral creature, you're an isolated creature as a human being. And you know, while there are a couple of hermits who may enjoy it, I don't know, monks somewhere on a mountain, for most of us, we need to be, actually, even monks live together, right? They're not really isolated. So you know, we need to be embedded in these social groups. And moral behavior, with small m, is how we do that, right? You play nice, I play nice. Um, and so that's kind of what makes the world go round. And this actually underlies economics. So as you know, there's a whole chapter in the book called Moral Markets. That market exchange is very much based on not having a policeman in every corner, a camera in every shop, even though there are some cameras and some policemen, just a little enforcement enough. It's that most people, most of the time, um, will behave well. So um, morality is actually what differentiates us as a species, that we think about consequences, we think about the future, and having that long-term view means that we, again, are much better able to extract value from all kinds of social relationships you know, around the world. And people do beautiful things. They, um, you know, they adopt little children that are not 
theirs and you know, care for them as if they were theirs because we have this very strong attachment system. Right? We get attached to pets. We name our cars. Who's named their car? <laughs> I thought it was just me. Okay. So right, why do we do that? Because they're moving. We spend time with them. We feel like they're part of our families, right? So we're a connecting creature. And I think knowing that and knowing how we connect, what inhibits it, what promotes it, really allows us to um, get the most out of life in every realm. Uh, we're going to open the floor to questions. Uh, we'd ask you to uh, wait to ask your question until you've got the microphone in hand, please. And uh, let's go. I think the first one's down here. Um, how does uh, religion play into all this, the moral molecule? And, and does it actually diminish trust in that it promotes differences among uh, different religious groups? What a great question. So, um, so there's a whole chapter in the book on religion. So it's, you know, I don't want to spend 20 minutes talking about it, although we could spend an hour. Um, and there's a short backstory which I'm going to tell you. So as I was writing this book, um, I had to sort of come to terms with why I spent 10 years studying the biology of morality. And the dishonest answer was, well, you know, trust is important to really alleviate poverty, and it's a good research question. Um, but I got 35 people in my lab all working on these issues. Why the heck? I mean, really. And um, as I started writing this, I realized that morality was a really big part of my life growing up um, because of a nun. I was raised Catholic, and uh, this nun's name was Sister Mary Maristella. And she uh, decided to quit the convent in 1957, and a couple years later became my mother. Uh, so, um, so I avoided all questions of religion in my research at every cost because the sort of top-down, thou shalt, thou shalt not, just didn't make sense to me. Like, only Catholics go to heaven? Why is that? It just didn't make any sense. So then again, I applied the weenie test to myself. I said, oh, I have to take on this issue. So the short answer is um, religious people don't release more oxytocin than non-religious people. But um, religion provides an opportunity to, uh, to practice uh, virtuous behaviors. You don't need that, but churches um, and, and many other religious organizations give you a chance to reach out to others. They build community. So we've actually done experiments in churches, in uh, Buddhist monasteries, um, uh, in Aboriginal peoples in the, in the Papua New Guinea highlands, and all these rituals release oxytocin, connect people to their community. We don't find that oxytocin release makes people connect or report feeling connected to God or some ultimate reality. Um, so um, some religions probably good. I don't think the rituals are going away. Uh, by the way, I spoke two weeks ago uh, in Harvard at a uh, humanist organization, which is sort of atheist agnostic, and they are having now starting to build ritual because even atheists need ritual, right? You need community. So, um, uh, so I try to make a separation between my own personal views and what the science shows. And the science makes a clear distinction, as you've suggested, between um, a sort of an Old Testament God, very testosterone, punishing, you have to do this, um, versus a New Testament God, which is, and I think the, the brilliance of this crazy hippie guy Jesus in the New Testament was just love everybody, right? That's pretty good um, advice. So um, I think we can take that heart, just love everybody. So I got that nickname, as you know, Zach, I got the name that Dr. Love because um, I want to promote this, that love's a real uh, uh, physical uh, reality. And um, at first I was sort of embarrassed when people called me Dr. Love. I thought, eh, what, what better thing can I do than to promote love and... Uh, you know, the easiest way is the eight hugs a day. But yeah, just, just be opening up. So yeah, I think religion can train that. By the way, in our, sorry, long answer, but in experiments where we do make religion um, a salient, so we have people, for example, worship in the lab, um, uh, depending on which religious group you're in, um, people get very in-group biased. So um, I'll, I'll let you read the book to find out which groups those are, but you might be able to guess. Uh, but anyway, um, but we can do this with, by the way, soldiers as well. So we have soldiers march in the lab, take their blood, measure their oxytocin. Their oxytocin's up, but then when they come to sharing money or trusting others, it's all about trusting other soldiers and not the civilians. So, um, you know, we can't connect to everybody. We can't share our resources with everybody. So, you know, the, on a first cut, if I don't know who to interact with, I'll interact with people who seem to be part of some group I'm a part of, my religious group, my work group. Um, so I think we have to work a little harder to extend that circle of, empathy um, beyond our own groups. Yeah, thanks, great question. Yes, here in the second row in the, toward the back. 
Hi, I was thinking about the Milgram study in the 60s, the famous Yale study, yeah. uh, with respect to trusting authority. And I'm wondering how that study and some of the things that you have discovered in your most recent research, uh, if there are any insights uh, correlating those two very famous studies. That's a great question. So uh, the short answer is I don't know. So the, the Milgram study, for people who don't know, is a study where, uh, I think it was in the early 60s, where um, a researcher kept telling you to turn up the electricity and you're, you purportedly were shocking this person and they're screaming and crying at some point. They say, turn it up the electricity, they gotta, you gotta finish the experiment. And, um, and some, but the majority of people continue to do that even though you know, the, they potentially were killing this other person. Um, so we certainly are good followers and oxytocin release um, makes us want to kind of join the herd. And, um, but having said that, I think the, the Milgram experiments were much more about uh, stress, about us feeling the pressure to conform what we found with oxytocin is that it's much more of a bottom-up kind of organic process of connection rather than this top-down. So again, in experiments where we have sort of authority figure, um, some people will follow the lead, but others actually will rebel. So I think one of the beauties of things like the rise of the internet um, is the sort of democratization of news, of um, uh, direction, uh, people really relying on themselves. and. Um, you know, I think it's a balance between being self-reliant and then joining the group. So I don't have a great answer for that, but I think you know, what we're seeing in the world is this sense of uh, greater self-reliance, greater uh, self-organization. And we've actually been studying some uh, companies that uh, have gotten rid of managers altogether and uh, basically have, have um, colleagues in the company self-organize. And so that's, I think that's an extreme case of that. So beyond transparency is just let people choose their own work group, their own work hours. Um, let them decide how they're going to do their work and get rid of the authority figure altogether. So where the authority is very important, I should say, is in crises. So I'm a sailor, and so you know, most of the time you're sailing, nothing, you know, you have a glass of wine, you relax. I know 1% of the time, something bad happens, and it happens fast. And then you need you know, a person in charge to say, okay, we're going to do A, B, and C now, because we've got to resolve this or someone's really going to get hurt. Um, so. But when things are going well, then I think the oxytocin approach can actually work. Um, again, sometimes that top-down is necessary, but often for individuals who are stable, um, you know, we can self-organize. By the way, I mentioned that 95% of the people get this response, this oxytocin response when they're trusted. 5% who don't, um, a couple percent of those are dangerous. So we find about one or 2% of our free-roaming humans that we test are psychopaths. And psychopaths don't feel empathy, they don't release oxytocin, they are not trustworthy. They'll take all the money on the table. They they enjoy it. They take advantage of other people. I recommend avoiding them. Right? You can't <laughs> fix them. Uh, so the other couple percent are people who have had very adverse life events. So we've actually shown that um, uh, in women who are repeatedly sexually abused, about half those don't release oxytocin. They don't have appropriate social behaviors. And you have the highly stressed out people. So high stress, as I mentioned earlier, is a big inhibitor to appropriate social behaviors. You guys know this. When you're super stressed out, you're not your nicest self. Uh, so again, we wouldn't expect everybody all the time to behave in this caring, loving way. But most people, most of the time, absent you know, real pathology, can be counted on to have this reciprocation. Again, because that's our nature as social creatures. Yeah, thanks. No more questions? We've, yeah, we've questions? blown them all away. Yes, please. Yes, Uh, just as a follow-up to that comment, uh, yeah. to avoid uh, the psychopaths. Yeah. So is there any little experiment we can do to identify the psychopaths <laughs> among mm. us? If I can get their blood. Uh, I can. So we've actually shown they have highly dysregulated oxytocin. By the way, this is the same for people with social anxiety, with autism, with schizophrenia. And we didn't talk about this, but you know, this crazy little molecule that no one cared about. There was no, really, there was no medical disorder known to be associated with too much or too little oxytocin 10 years ago, other than preterm labor. Um, it just wasn't seen to be, didn't have any effect on the brain. It was just this kind of birth hormone. Um, now there's a ton of clinical trials going on. So um, there are um, kind of intriguing p bits of evidence that oxytocin may help alleviate some of these in, um, inappropriate social behaviors in psychiatric patients. But not for psychopaths, because they seem to be lacking the receptors for oxytocin. So even if they make oxytocin, it just has no effect on them. Um, so how do you spot the psychopath? I think it's this old Russian proverb, trust but verify. You know, trust a little bit. And if you're constantly getting screwed over or you're getting these, you know, dicey signals, 
again, it's, it's one to two percent of the U.S. population. It's 40 percent of the prison population. Okay, so um, the key finding would be lack of empathy. So, uh, you know, if they're nice to you, but they're trashing, you know, a joint friend, you know, not so good. If they're really always looking out for themselves, not so good. Um, so, there, you know, there are formal checklists you can go through. Actually, there's a great book called The, the uh, Psychopath Test, which is a fun book to read all about psychopaths. Uh, but yeah, lack of empathy would be the hallmark. And, and you've also talked about, uh, Paul, some folks uh, who you've worked on. You shared um, one story in particular that you did in conjunction with a TV program um, on a, a woman, actually, not a man, a woman right. who, you, who you described as uh, just below the pot part of the population that's literally psychopathic that lacks the receptors for oxytocin are people who have the receptors, but you've described them as kind of testosterone poisoned. Too much testosterone. Right. And there's this one woman in particular who um, might, might answer the question in part. You can talk about some of the typical behaviors she exhibited that, that were evidence. Uh, and back to the religion question, by the way. I think the seven deadly sins, forget about heaven and God, they're deadly because they separate us from a social group, right? They say, hey, it's all about me if I'm a glutton or a, if I'm lazy. So anyway, so this shows on seven deadly sins. I had hoped, of course, to get lust. I thought I could do lust. No, I didn't get it. I got greed. So anyway, the, the shtick was that um, they brought in this woman from the Donald Trump show, The Apprentice, gorgeous, early 30s, blonde, wealthy, famously greedy. And so indeed, she didn't release oxytocin in our test. We shot oxytocin into her brain, no effect. Um, but what's the downside? She's bad at relationships. Um, she's really self-interested. She has, she has very high testosterone levels. I mean, from the back, you think she was a 15-year-old boy. I mean, the best legs you've ever seen in your life. Um, but she has a very kind of difficult life. Even though she's a very nice person and she, she cooperates when money, we did tests with her that don't involve money and she's very cooperative. But when it comes to money, it's all about her. But she had a very unusual background as well. Her father was a drug dealer. Um, but although she had a very high IQ, you know what happens to drug dealers? They eventually die, he died. Um, so yeah, it's tough. And so again, I think back to the psychopath issue, um, you know, background matters. I mean, for, for almost everyone we tested who don't have severe childhood abuse or abandonment, their oxytocin systems work well. But that couple of percent who really have really adverse childhoods, again, half of them are resilient and the other half aren't. And so, um, you know, she was resilient at one level, but she just lacked the, the brain mechanism to really attach and feel empathy for others. Yes, I think uh, we'll take these two as the, as the last two. So let's start with the gentleman there in the third row. Uh, building on what you were just speaking about, I'm wondering if any research has been done on attachment parenting. Uh, in these early formative years, it seems to me the circuits, the home circuits, and the ability to release oxytocin might be encouraged by attachment parenting. Has that been explored at all? Uh, it hasn't. Thanks, Tyler. It's uh, one of my students from Claremont. Um, uh, so, right. Uh, this work is so new. Um, as I mentioned earlier, one of my colleagues 10 years ago said this was the world's stupidest idea. Um, so now there's lots of researchers uh, working on this, and uh, we're just starting to see work on uh, parents and children. We've actually looked at, for example, a relationship with animals, dogs and cats. Um, not surprisingly, dogs are better stress reducers than cats. Uh, neither of them release oxytocin uh, when you pet them, as far as I can tell. But um, uh, So one example of this, I think, is how to, how to rearrange our lives. I know Tyler has a young daughter. Yeah is, um, I have young kids too, I started thinking about the timeout. The timeout says, you're misbehaving, we don't want to be around you. But that doesn't make any sense neurologically, so I created the time in. So the time in says, you're having a bad day, what do you need? You need more time in dad, so you have to sit in my lap for as many minutes as you are old. So the nice thing about the time in is, it's very calming, my nine-year-old loves it. My daughter who's 13 is scared to death, I'll do this when her friends are over. So it works both ways. <laughs> so. Very, very good. And uh, yes, please, the uh, um, woman here in the second row. Yeah, my question was, uh, the person who does not react to the oxygen, is there um, a way to bring them to? That's a great question. So we don't fully know. Um, uh, I'll tell you a short story. Um, we had done some work on social anxiety, which got a lot of press, and uh, um, one of the London newspapers, um, they're interviewing me, and this reporter kept on say, using the word cure. I said, no, oxytocin's not going to cure social anxiety. Um, it may help a little bit, and we have, you know, one study showing it helps a little bit. Um, 
Anyway, blah, 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 I get a phone call from a woman, you know, you can't make this stuff up, a woman named Ethel in Northern England who had read about my research, of course they used the word cure in the article, and she said, how do I get this stuff? My daughter has terrible social anxiety. Her daughter had gone to university, she worked at a corporate office, and she said, look, if she, if she has to do a presentation to more than three people, she flips out, she just can't do it. So I mentioned everything I've told you guys. Uh, by the way, a common uh, drug streak antidepressants, uh, sorry, it's a common antidepressants, Prozac Paxil, actually will help release a little more oxytocin as well. So serotonin and oxytocin work together. So I mentioned antidepressants, dogs, uh, uh, touch, massage therapy. She said, oh, really? She said, it's interesting because my daughter just quit her corporate job a couple months ago and she's now in massage therapy school. And she told me that the only time she feels she can connect to other people is when she's giving them a massage. So that's almost diagnostic of an oxytocin dysfunction. So, so this woman found a way to connect to others. So again, absent the psychopaths and people with really adverse life events, there's evidence that we can train ourselves to release more oxytocin. If you're way out there, probably you can't. But for most people, I think we can get better. And so we just have to find the ways that kind of work for us. And usually it's gonna be somehow in community. Um, you know, that could be your health club, it could be your church, it could be your place of work. Um, or it could be the particular actions. And so, again, one short example is because my kids are little, we have the no electronics rule. So when we're going out as a family, all the electronics go off. I mean, I leave my phone on just for emergencies, but I try not to take calls and really be fully present and make sure that my kids feel like I'm really there for them. I'm really paying attention to them, the most important thing in the world. But then port that over to every other relationship, right? Wouldn't that be great if your spouse, if your friends, if you were really there and think how much closer you'd feel to them and boom, now we've got the positive feedback loop going. So um, yeah, great question. So I'll be around, I'm happy to sign books or just chat uh, out in the lobby. And uh, Moral Molecules, a wonderful read. Paul will be signing books. Let's thank, thank him so for his time guys. here. Thanks for coming. Thank you, thank you Paul Dack and Zachary Furst.